Hey, everybody, I'm Duncan Hood, and welcome to Sea Stories. And today we have Nicholas Alley joining us from way up north. Where are you, Nicholas? Uh, I'm in Mystic, Connecticut, or actually, more appropriately, Stonington, the town next door. What a great but, place to be. This is, a series is. Of, this is a series of Sea Stories presentations uh, sponsored by the American Schooner Association and co-sponsored by the great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race. And our emphasis is on finding out about the movers and shakers in our industry, how they got there, and learning a little bit about their lives. Having said that, Nicholas Alley has been a fixture, if you can believe that. I'm using that word, Nicholas. A fixture. I'm impressed. In the sailing world. I've been waiting to use that phrase forever. And uh, I've crossed paths with Nicholas many times over the years. I, the one time I really remember was about seven years ago, Nicholas. I was in Mystic, and you said, let's go to lunch. And I said, great, where? And Nick, Nicholas goes, there's a fish fry at the Portuguese Holy Ghost Society. And I thought it was such a great name for a place. I said, well, count me in. It was great fun. Super duper. It, it so definitely is a, a local regional event. Uh, yeah, very much really, beloved. It really, really is. Now, just a couple uh, ground rules, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot see or hear you during the presentation. However, we are running a Q&A, so a question and answer panel. If you look at the bottom of your screens, you should have, <clears throat> excuse me, a Q&A uh, emblem right along the bottom. If you click that, you'll be able to type in your questions for Nicholas. Excuse me. Yeah, there we go. My chat is disabled, I see. Let's just take a look. Okay. Chris Lundberg, everybody. Okay. I'm going to have to figure out how to work chat while we go, panelists, attendees. All right, guys, try that chat one more time, if you wouldn't mind. Let's see if we get anybody in there. Yep, got them. Thank you, Chris L. And uh, Gerardo says, okay. Fantastic. Very cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, having said that, uh, I'd like to uh, present you with Nicholas Alley, who has sailed all over the place, and he's got quite a career to tell us about. So thank you very much, Nicholas. Take it away, my friend. Oh, thank screen. you, Duncan. Let me just go ahead and get myself set up and shared screen here. I got that part right. Nice. And now I'm going to go to presenter view. I'm oh, saying these words, that. everybody, because Duncan has been teaching me all of this, and he has not mentioned that the only reason this is happening is because he has the technical capabilities of making it happen and dragging me along with it. It was a great drag. <laughs> <laughs> I do not embrace modern technologies by driving 100-year-old schooners, so uh, that's, that's my default, although uh, I have had to come kipping and kicking and screaming. So... Yeah, so as Duncan has said, uh, I am Nicholas Alley. Uh, I have been a boat captain and played with boats for most of my life. Um, I My first license was in 1984. So in 2024, I will have had this license for 40 years. Uh, it's pretty amazing, uh, considering uh, this was never a career path that I had intended. Um, Basically, uh, I had boats a lot when I was younger. I was involved in them uh, and played with boats, but never really saw that. And my career uh, has not been a focused direction as much as it is, is just following the general flow and, and what we're calling uninspected opportunities. And uh, you'll see as I go through some of my stories and the boats and programs I've worked with, a lot of times I ended up going somewhere because uh, an unexpected opportunity presented itself in a question or a quote or somebody that I might have known who says, hey, by the way, what are you doing? And the other part is, is that I generally took those opportunities when they came to me. Um, I have always been driven by learning new things. And one of the best ways for me to learn is to go get a job doing it. So that's how I ended up doing some of the amazing things 
uh, that I've, I've done throughout my career. Um, as I said, I did was played with boats when I was a young man. My father was a boat person. Um, he had a dire dow. He bought a boat. Now you'll see a little bit of that. The picture that I have here is community boating on the Charles River in Boston. And uh, I started sailing here when I was 11 years old. And uh, what a wonderful place it was. And what a great thing for an inner city kid to be able to do. Um, back then, I don't know if it's still the same, but you could join for a dollar for the entire summer. And all you had to do was go down to the Ridge Ave pool and get a swim test. And then once you came in, they taught you everything you needed to know. You would go ahead and get your skills and test up and settle in and get your various ratings. Uh, and most of the boats we used were what are shown here, the Cape Cod Mercuries uh, built down there in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Indestructible. And they had, it seemed like a million of them. Um, they also have evolved quite a bit over the years and they had 420s and much faster boats and you could go ahead and train on those and get to know those. What really helps keep the programs going at community boating is certainly uh, donations, but also the adult programs. And uh, they pay a little bit more than a dollar to sail with community boating. And of course, there's a lot of outside funding. I send them a check every year because uh, it, it, it meant a lot to me to have that as being part of my life. The other part of my sailing background was right here in Esther Hill's Boatyard at Chelsea, Mass. Uh, and as you can see, it was not necessarily a modern marina style boatyard as much as a old working boatyard on Chelsea Creek, which is where most of the oil and fuel comes into the Boston area. Uh, what you see there is a hull that has been recently turned over right side up and uncovered and you could see the plastic covering in front of my, my dad's old Saab. And that is Polly. And Polly started life as a 25 foot Navy launch, a, a wooden motor launch, open deck and everything. And uh, the first year he bought it, he paid $250. He put a star rig in it and we went off sailing around Boston Harbor, uh, quite adventurous to say the least. Um, and then we brought the boat back, pulled it out of the water, and it sat in Esther Hills for about nine years. And that Navy launch turned into what you can see here, the beginnings of the boat. Nicholas? Uh, the top, yeah, it was. You want, if you want to point, you can use your mouse. Oh, I can? I can point like this? Yeah, wherever you want to point it, yeah. Oh, look at that. So there's the boat, there's the truck, there's Esther Hills boat yard. Um, but, but basically we, we raised the top sides, built the deck, put a deck on it, uh, fiberglass, the whole thing. Uh, he was in the business of uh, engineering business. So he came up with epoxies before they were really popular. And as a foam core deck, he built the entire rig that went with it. We spent a lot of time in the machine shop and, and made the fittings and fasteners. And that's where I got a lot of my chops as far as my engineering and, and a lot of my sailing. Um, Esther Hills is one of those boat yards that nothing grows. And you can see there's not a tree or a plant in sight. Uh, but it was certainly part of my youth, and so was it sanding fiberglass. Uh, I remember my father making me take my blue jeans off because they were going to leave blue marks on the on the, the white pigmented uh, polyester resin. So I would I remember sitting upside on the boat when it was upside down uh, in my underwear sanding. Uh, it was a different time. This is, of course, back when you used to wash your hands with acetone. So, but anyway, I made it through there. And one of my first jobs working on the waterfront was at the Boston Harbor Sailing Club. And I had decided I wanted to work on boats, found these guys, called them up. They said, come on in. I went in for an interview and the owner of the club said, well, we've got a bunch of Pearson 26s and we need somebody to wash them. Uh, they sat on moorings and uh, he basically, I rowed out and he jumped, I jumped on the boat. And he said, okay, we'll bring the boat in. And I said, I, I've never run a motor. I don't know how to. So he showed me how to start the old 9-9 that was hanging off the back. And, uh, and I motored into the dock. And to this day, it is probably the best docking I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> so I was hired and washed boats and eventually started, moved up to maintenance and uh, fleet stuff. And, and, uh, and it, I was able to use the skills I had, but I also learned a great deal of working on this entire fleet of boats. Uh, the boat, the, the boat was program was a membership club and the members had use of the boats They're all on the moorings right there at Rose Wharf. I'm sure if anybody sailed in Boston, you would have run across them. 
but that was my uh, alma mater, and, uh, and it was a very, very cool place to spend some of my time. Nice. Um, I reached my uh, I reached my three year limit, which is about how long I generally like to work places. And, uh, and one day I walked to the, the end of the dock where the Andiama was, and I asked the captain if he was looking for any crew, any help, and he was looking for some delivery crew. And so uh, so I signed up and signed aboard for the uh, sum of an airline ticket home. And uh, and that was the beginning of some of my adventures. And that was uh, this right here. And this is Andiamo, my first offshore sailing trip. Uh, I had to join the boat in Oxford, Maryland. So I uh, uh, not <laughs> I didn't know how to get there. So I looked it up, went to the library, got a, took a train down to a place called Annapolis, Maryland. Thought it was a really nice little place and continued on to Oxford. And we left from Oxford and uh, passed through the Virginia Capes and I started getting seasick. Wow. And uh, I basically remained seasick the entire way until we reached the Virgin Islands. And uh, pretty much some people would have thought that that was pretty much the end of my sailing career, but I'm a little hard headed. Um, and you know, my watch mate the first evening when the captain said, I don't want him on board, want it, want, I, you know, I don't want him up on deck. Scott said, no, I do. I want him on deck and he has to come up. And he, and, we, and he talked with me about getting seasick and how it's part of the business and you have to get over it and work your way through. And that, I, I still remember the man's name, Scott Villargo. And that seasick talk probably saved my career because I still get seasick. And I, I, the stuff that I learned that night uh, from Scott was just what keeps me going. Nice. You know, get sick, make yourself better, work as hard as you can when you stop. When you're going to throw up, stop, throw up, get back on there. The other part that was neat about the trip is that uh, there was a sailing instructor from, from the Boston Harbor Sailing Club on board, Bobby Britton, who became legendary in the sail training community as well, and his wife-to-be Sinbad were on board. And they were the ones that actually took this picture. So it's a pretty pretty neat experience. And there we go, you know, because they come full circle, just like Duncan. I've run into Bobby, you know, uh, many, many times over the years. Hey, Nicholas. Yep. Let's move your mouse to the right and just get it off the screen for now. Oh, okay, sorry. You go. Good. All right, so uh, so I ended up in St. Croix and uh, I was walking around and saw the Annapolis Sailing School, was kind of looking in the fence and somebody came out and asked me if I could help them. And, uh, and they said, and I said, no, I'm fine. They said, are you looking for a job? And I said, what do you got? Uh, and that was how I ended up working with the Annapolis Sailing School. Uh, I took the plane home the next day, saw my mother. She said, how was it? I said, great, I'm going back in two weeks. And that was the last time I lived in the city of Austin. Um, I, I started teaching basic sailing on rainbows. We, did, we had five O-Day 37s that we would maintain and they would go out on week long cruises. I wasn't part of those, but I was part of the transits between Annapolis and St. Croix every spring and fall. And we would take three boats and one shot, uh, sail them up, or down as required. Um, this was the beginning of some of my uh, other offshore experience in O'Day 37s. And, uh, you know, they were, they were tough, tough little boats that kept plugging away. Uh, but I certainly a lot of, learned a lot of seamanship from the, from the captains. And I sailed as mate. And, and the school uh, really liked the idea of having me get my license so they could brag that they had two licenses on the boat. So they paid for a captain's school class in 1984, and I got my license, and that was the first license uh, paid for by the Annapolis Sailing School. So, what the uh, what the sailing school did down there is we would do week long rainbow classes, basic sailing uh, out among the reefs, Buck Island, and dodging seaplanes because that was a seaplane base next door. So, we would have to keep a weather eye out for planes coming in and landing or taking off. Uh, needless to say, it certainly set the students for a little bit of a scare. Uh, when a plane would take off over their heads. Um, I love being there. Um, uh, this week's here is an O day 37. You can see the weather's a little right, lively there down there, 25 knots in the, in the Christmas winds. Uh, the sailing was great. The pay was low, humble living, you know, uh, didn't have a whole lot of money. Rum was 99 cents a bottle. Uh, so so we, it, was, it was perfect. What you, could you ask for more than that when you're 20 years old? So this is what I did for three winters. And during the summers, I would return back to Annapolis and uh, I would do a variety of different things. Um, we would go back, we would get all the rainbows ready. Um, 
I would do cruise and they would put together these same style cruises uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. And we had a flotilla of boats uh, with a mothership. And during the day we would sail with the students on these boats from one destination to the next. And at night we would all climb aboard an old Hatteras that they owned. And that was our dormitory for the evening. And we would do you know, four stops in the back to Annapolis on Friday and go out and do the same thing again Monday morning. Um, again, it was just you know, a pretty amazing life for a 21 year old person, 22, 23 or whatever. Uh, and, and, and the people that I was working with were all, all like-minded. We just had a great bunch of people and a great location. Uh, during the fall, uh, the Annapolis Boat Show would come in and the company that owned the sailing school also owned uh, Annapolis uh, Boat Show. And we would go out and build all the docks and bring in all the boats. And we would work insane amount of hours over a three week period, bringing the boats for the Annapolis Inwater Power Boat Sailboat Show. It was just incredible. And, uh, you know, and then I also started driving tour boats and water taxis in the harbor. And I lived and did what I could in Annapolis for, for many years. I, I loved Annapolis. I lived there 15 years by the time it was all said and done. Uh, but my three years were coming up. So I moved on to the next event. And after three years in the winters in St. Croix, Carl Prosser and Amanda Madeira came through looking for a hot shower one night. And uh, I said hello and got them set up. And then Carl turned to me and he said he was an engineer on a three-masted staysail schooner called Rambler. And, uh, and they were sailing uh, with Ori's, the Ocean Research and Educational Association, who was running Regina Maris. And Regina had reached the end of her useful life. So they bought this to cover the, cover the program. Um, back then, um, all of these sail training boats were uh, mostly research vessels. So she railed, sailed out of Gloucester and followed the humpback pods south to the winter breeding grounds at uh, Silver Banks off the coast of the DR. And uh, so I jumped on board uh, the Rambler there and Carl was able to go up to being chief mate. And uh, that was the beginning of, of another grand adventure. Uh, you can see that picture aloft looking down. Uh, that was the annual cockroach races that we would have. Uh, back in those days, all the boats were flooded with, with cockroaches. And basically a circle was drawn on deck and you pick up your cup and your the first cockroach to reach race out of the circle would be the winner. Um, uh, in this particular case, um, <laughs> I won because my cockroach was dead and the trade winds took it out of the circle much faster than anyone could crawl. But uh, that was some of the ways that we went through life there on, on the old Rambler. Uh, you can see from the picture, she's already tired there, but she was a fast boat and she was uh, pretty, pretty amazing speed, And uh, but she was tired. Uh, what we did on the Silver Bank, uh, which lies just north of the Dominican Republic, is we motored around during the day doing a variety of scientific studies. Uh, we were doing fluke identification photographs. We were doing sonograph stuff. Uh, they were counting whales and the whales were everywhere. Uh, they were doing all of the behaviors that we hear so much about, freight training and flipper flopping and sky, sky hopping and everything else. Um, and, and we would just go out every day, get underway. We were actually operating on the reef and it was an uncharted reef, uh, but they had really started to develop their own charts. And what we used for navigation was uh, range and bearings. It was a shipwreck uh, on the Northeast quadrant there. And they would take range and bearings with radar and, and compass, and they would actually do sunlines. And they would do sunlines all day long, the same way that most folks would just take a regular bearing. They got so fast to be able to, to reduce the sights. Um, so we, we managed to come and go fairly uneventfully. And, um, and here's some of the, some of the uh, you know, pictures of, of the boat in there. Uh, one of the biggest stories that I've ever had from being on the banks is I was tending the small boat following the students one day and uh, a mother and a calf came by to check me out. And uh, I, I, I remember the, the feeling of when she looked at me and she was no more than 30, 35 feet from me. And she went by and the calf was trying to come over and get a look too. And she moved her fin down to, to stop him and went right by, and then I saw her look directly at me with, with, her, with, her, with her eye, which was the size of a dinner plate. 
and then just kept right on going. And then the turbulence from her going by was just, just overwhelming. It was a, it was a moment I will never forget. But um, really amazing stories from that boat. Uh, I joined the ship in Porta Plata, which we would return to every two weeks for provisions and parts. Uh, ship was tired. She was running on her backup systems. I was green as the green goes and worked really, really hard to try to figure out stuff. Uh, all the manuals were in Spanish. My Spanish was terrible or non-existent. Uh, and when I did go ashore to go buy parts, the vendor took pity on me and would, would let me walk around and pick out what I wanted. And uh, I would come back and, you know, with my, my drawings and my, my uh, information that I looked up in the vocabulary dictionary. Uh, but it was all quite creative. And uh, at the end of the season, we headed back north and, uh, and actually anchored in Boston Harbor within visual sight of a house that I grew up in or had lived in. And as the sun rose, we anchored after really early in the morning. And as the sun rose and the bottle of rum went around, I just realized what an incredible journey that I had just taken. Six months on this boat, all these places, all these things. And uh, once again, it was all uh, unintended opportunity because Carl and Amanda were looking for a shower and said, oh, by the way. So uh, next uh, I went on back to Annapolis and unpacked and settled in, looked for more work. Um, the Pride of Baltimore II had recently sunk and uh, I decided that staying local might be good. So I spent a lot more time up in the upper Chesapeake Bay, Annapolis, and then on into Baltimore. Um, it was uh, it was great place to be. It was a great time to be there. There was a lot of boats doing very cool programs, and you could see some of them here. Uh, Lady Maryland, Minnie V, and Mildred Bell uh, were some of those. Um, what drew me up there is during uh, during boat show, Lady Maryland came in, and uh, I looked up and I said, "What a beautiful boat! Do you need any crew? I have a license." And they said, "Come talk to me after that." So. Uh, two weeks later, I was on board Lady Maryland uh, as, a, as a second mate and uh, off doing programs on and around the Chesapeake Bay in Baltimore. Um, it was the same day that I interviewed was the same day that Pride of Baltimore II was commissioned. And uh, I sailed for the one season as, as made on, on Lady Maryland. And then they bought Mildred Bell, which is the Chesapeake Bay by boat. Uh, and, uh, and that's her right here. And uh, I was her first captain and worked the season on her as well. And she was perfect for the nooks and crannies of the harbor. Um, you know, when Lady Marilyn gets set sail and goes sailing around to do wonderful, wonderful things that way, we were the ones crawling into the corners and doing trawl nets and water quality tests and uh, uh, dealing with the radios. We used to go alongside the, the U.S. Naval ship Comfort, the hospital ship, and we would get close enough so everybody could reach over the side and actually touch the ship. Uh, which gave you a great idea how big she truly was when you were right that close to her. Um, but it was, it was wonderful. And it was here that I realized how much I liked working with kids and boats. It just made so much sense. Boats are wonderful. They can be boring on long trips, but you had a bunch of kids, you know, a school size group and it can turn into chaos and a lot of fun. And that's what we, we went through. Um, that was the Living Classrooms program or the Lady Maryland program, which now then became Living Classrooms. So these are a couple of pictures uh, of me as a young man. Uh, that's me with all my hair at the helm of Lady Maryland. And uh, here I am explaining some water quality to a student uh, who was looking kind of befuddled as we tried to figure out the salinity and, and all the other things that uh, went, went on with um, you know, some of the programs that we did. So, but I stayed with them for a couple of years uh, doing that. And then I had the opportunity to sail on this boat here. And this is, uh, this is Mini V. Mini V is a 1906 Chesapeake Bay skipjack, an oyster dredge boat. And it was owned by the city of Baltimore. Um, the operated it, it, in, the, in the winter, she dredged oysters. So she still went down to Tillman, Tillman Island and Johnny Moda Vidlak would, would go out and drudge, drudge with her. Uh, and then the other three seasons, um, Bob Keith, who had an organization called Ocean World Institute, uh, would, would go ahead and, <clears throat> and act as the operating agent. Bob was an interesting fellow. He, uh, he had been an editor at Washington Post. And somewhere along the long line, uh, he had had a small skipjack built. Uh, and then when he retired, he started Ocean World Institute as a, as a printing and education uh, outfit. And... Uh, 
uh, uh, Bob was a good, good man, and he treated me really well. I ended up working for Bob for three years, and, and in the winter when times got slow, I, I worked on his house and did repair work, and uh, you know, he could never pay me more than the $12 an hour that was the rate of the day. Uh, and so I thought that was pretty decent money. And, and back then it kind of was, uh, but it was a living wage. And that's all I really needed because I was sailing every day. Uh, we would do, uh, we work with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in the spring and we did a roving program and we would spend one week in town all over the Chesapeake Bay doing water quality studies uh, and going sailing. And in many cases we would go off the, uh, uh, the, the oyster dredging grounds and use a small dredge and dredge oysters with the kids. Um, and <laughs> there were times when we'd be up off at of Tillman and we'd be out there with the other skipjacks and, and Johnny Motovidlak used to come by and sail by and he'd stand there in full suit in the cold spring weather and tell me, and he'd say, you tell them kids to stay in school because you don't want to be out here doing this. And, uh, and so it was, a, it was pretty amazing to, to be part of that and in the middle of all that. And the kids, uh, the kids are all pretty sharp. And one of the interesting parts is because most of the kids who are on the boat were local to that area. So they knew about scraping, scraping oysters and, and work in the water. So, uh, so I actually learned a lot from them as well. So uh, during the summer, uh, things would get a little quiet out there in the education department. And so we would start doing historic tours in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, hour and a half historic tours, many of them based on one of Bob, uh, Bob Keith's books, uh, Baltimore Harbor, A Picture History. If you get a copy, it's a pretty neat one. And, uh, and we will go out and uh, just do an hour and a half tour and come back. We did that four or five times a day. Um, we would get speakers in the evening uh, sometimes on, on Wednesdays, when Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, but it was neat, you know, and we were tied up right down in the center of the Inner Harbor, right next to the Constellation and among the water taxis. Um, so it was it was a pretty nice life, and I stayed there doing that for for again about two and two and a half three seasons, um, and uh, but that sort of was my time point, and things started getting interesting. Um, this picture here shows me on the bow of Mini V, um, but what you could see in the background, you could see the silos right there, uh, and those are the, the silos are the grain piers on Locust Point, and down in here is the loading platforms. Uh, further down Locust Point in one direction at the, at the eastern end uh, is um, Fort McHenry and the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air is what made that place uh, famous. Uh, on the other end over by the grain piers and further into town was where most of the shipbuilding and the shipping was done before the ships got, got too big to work in the inner harbor. Uh, and, and it was over in there uh, that Pride One was built, and uh, it was also there that uh, I met Joe McGady. And uh, Joe McGady has uh, uh, played a big part in my life a couple of different times. In this particular case, I was bringing Mildred, excuse me, uh, Minnie V into the dock. I was by myself. I brought the boat over to General Ship and was tying it up. And I looked ahead, and there were a couple of outward bound pulling boats there. And I'd always been interested in outward bound. And there was this guy standing there and we started talking and he complimented me on running the boat and I complimented him on the outward the bound pulling boats and come to find out he was a watch leader for outward bound. And, uh, and so the long, by the end of the conversation, uh, we had talked about him getting me on a week long program so I could try the program. And, uh, and, uh, and then that's what I did that fall. And I remember going to Bob who ran the mini B and I said, Bob, I, I, I am going to do this week long trip. I'm sorry if it's short notice, but this is important to me. Um, I hope that I can still work here after I get back. And Bob relented and, and so, so I did. And uh, so, so basically that's how I became an outward bound instructor. And the next spring I went uh, up to Maine and jumped in the water in, the, in April. I remember going up, March or April, I remember going up and stopping at LL Beans and buying a pair of gloves and a swimsuit knowing that I was going to use both of them in the same day. Uh, here is uh, an outward bound pulling boat sitting looking idle. Um, the outward bound program was developed during the Second World War. And what was happening was there were a lot of shipwrecks and a lot of men were ending up in life rafts and lifeboats. And what they found there was that the 
the older crew with life experience were surviving much better than the young folks who had no challenges or experience. And so a program was put together to put these folks and start helping them develop their survival skills and challenge them and make them realize that living, you know, a dozen people on a 30 foot boat really wasn't that bad as long as you just took your time and, and worked together. And that became the basis for the outward bound uh, pulling boat program. 28 day program was the, was the standard. Um, so I went off to train, went up to Maine, got all set, got hired by Joe. And, uh, and I ended up working for the chest for outward bound for about two and a half, three years variety of different ports. Uh, most of the locations were, uh, uh, most of my trips were in the Chesapeake Bay region, which was just beautiful. Um, a lot, some of the stuff was up in Maine uh, at, uh, in Rockland and Penobscot Bay. And then they also had some adjudicated youth programs down in Florida, uh, which didn't use pulling boats. They used canoes on the rivers and the Okeechobee and the sand and the alligators. Um, it, it was not as much fun as sailing a pull -a boat, pulling boat on the Chesapeake Bay or in Maine. But, uh, but I did that and that was, that was a definitely challenge. I did not like, I don't like canoes, I don't like sand and I don't like alligators, but, but I did my, did my bid and stayed with them for a while. Um, this page has uh, a lot of the outward bound stuff and you can see a little bit of what life is like on an outward bound pulling boat. We had two instructors and 10 kids on the boat, up to 10 kids. Uh, we slept on the oars. And in that picture, you could see the oars, which would get spread out. And then you would put your Ensolite pad and your sleeping bags on top of that, and then sleep sardine fashion between the masts. Now, anytime anybody had to move, you had to move too. Uh, and movement was because there were anchor watches. So up and forward of the foremast, you see that fellow that's standing there as a bow watch, that was also where you would do bow watch and anchor watch. And there was also a nice little seat there, uh, a wooden bucket, excuse me, a wooden box that held a five gallon bucket. And that was the head for the boat. We did not go over the side because we were in protected waters. And so we carried a number of those buckets that would fill up and then be capped off and duct taped uh, to help we get rid of them and down below until we got back to port. Um, some of the other photographs, you can see that we actually had sails up when we're sailing. Uh, Chesapeake Bay in the summertime, not a lot of breeze, a lot of rowing, a little bit of sailing. Uh, but we still did a lot of our challenges and, and, and working with the outward bound groups. The instructor's job was not only to keep them alive and safe and feed them, but also to help with their education. And outward bound is big on learn by doing and also making people figure out stuff on their own. Uh, so we would have challenges that were sometimes artificially created. Um, and sometimes they were just the challenges of living on a 30 foot boat with 12 people. Um, one of them right here, you can see, you notice that the, the boat is empty and everybody's outside the boat. Uh, this was a particular clove that we like to go to, but you had to get across the sandbar and of course, you know, we didn't tell them, we just said, we want to go there. And it was their job to get us there. So they would run aground on the bar and we would sit down and go, what, what, what can we do? What can we do? And they would sit down and process it, figure it out. And eventually one or two kids would get out and start pushing or try to sound for deep water. Uh, and then eventually everybody would figure out they had to get out and push the boat over the bar, which they did here in this photograph. And then they would proceed on into, uh, uh, into the cove. Some of the other challenges we would present would be the famous uh, blind sail. So you would take two people, one would be blind and could do things with a blindfold, of course, and the other person could tell them what to do, but couldn't do anything. So these were some of the activities. We, I, we used to take the rudder off and let it fall off the back of the boat when they were sailing, and then they had to go back and figure out how to get it. We used to do all kinds of things. Uh, one of the most challenging things, however, was actually the morning dip. And every morning after you would clean up and get your gear put away, before we would go any further, we would everybody had to jump off the boat and into the water and get back on the boat. And uh, part of it was just a challenge. And then, of course, part of it was a cleanliness thing. But uh, that was one of the more challenging things, especially in some of those cold spring or fall mornings. Um, 
but that was part of the outward bound culture and that's what we did. So it was a, a lot of learning by all uh, there. During the winters, I was doing this uh, in the summers and during the winters I started uh, sailing on Spirit of Massachusetts. Same thing, Spirit came into Baltimore one day, I looked over and I said, oh my goodness, what a beautiful boat. I looked up and an engineer popped his head up and he had been an engineer in another boat and I knew him and I went, oh, hey, how you doing? And uh, he introduced me to the captain and the next thing I know, I was signed on as crew on board the Spirit of Massachusetts. Uh, Spirit's a replica of a Fredonia style fishing schooner uh, and she was built in 1986. Uh, great, beautiful boat, great sailor, a um, lot of history and a lot of great people involved with the boat. Uh, I joined in 93 as uh, for Seamaster as a third mate engineer. The boat sailed under a variety of different owners, but she'd always been sort of a sail training boat and that was her process. Uh, the program that I started working with was a Seamaster program, which is a 12 week college accredited program and uh, run by, it was run by Long Island University. And basically it would start in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the fall in New England somewhere, sometimes Boston, sometimes Gloucester. And then we would head south to the Caribbean and, and, uh, and stop uh, every three to five days to do education programs ashore. Uh, there were two professors on the boat. Um, and uh, one of them, Doug Hardy, is a legend in the industry. And he, he had a way of developing uh, amazing programs that, that, that were very challenging and kind of goofy and silly at the same time. Um, you know, we would, do, we would do the obligatory water qualities. We would, we would catch the lugworms off of the Hampton coast. We'd go to the Mariners Museum. That was always neat. We would go down to Florida before we would jump off to the, the, through the Bahamas out of Florida in St. Mary's, Georgia. And we, they would go to the Okefenokee Swamp and, and, and run through there for a day. Uh, we would go out through the Bahamas and we would stop at the uh, islands of, uh, particularly the out islands like uh, where Morton Salt is from, um, Rum Key, which has the largest flamingo flock in the world. And we would do the wade of the upper lip, in which case we walked across an abandoned flooded salt plant until we, the water was up to our upper lip. Uh, or, or in Anagua, we would go to the cave of indescribable horrors and crawl through the bat trap to get down into the tunnels underneath that in, at this time at high tide were flooded. And we would go down in through there, swim in the flooded tunnels. It was, it was unbelievable. And Doug had dozens and dozens of programs like this. He did the program for close to 25 years. So, and then the same thing on the return trip north. During the winter, we would just go ahead, pick up whatever work we could. Um, and uh, that was usually week-long programs. Uh, later on, uh, the boat, we, we, they took over the gamage as well, and that was the beginning of Ocean Classrooms program. Uh, we continued to do the SIU, LIU, uh, Seamaster program, but uh, there was another program that was developed called Ocean Classrooms, and Ocean Classrooms was similar to Seamaster, but it was done for the Proctor Academy, and it was high school program. And uh, so the boats did both of that. And then later on, uh, she was joined by the uh, um, uh, by Schooner Westward. So those were the three boats that Ocean Classroom had at their high point. Um, meanwhile, I had decided I wanted to go back and work with troubled youth. And uh, I got a billet on the Harvey Gamage, uh, correction, excuse me, the Bill of Rights. And my notes say that she was built by the Harvey Gamage Yard in Maine. Uh, she was well known in the Newport area around where we are right now, Long Island Sound. Uh, and uh, she had sailed out of Newport and a lot, of the, a lot of the folks my age remember her sailing or sailed aboard her back in the early days. Um, where I got to know her is when she was being run by an organization called Vision Quest. And they work with troubled youth, uh, kids in and out, so mostly adjudicated youth as, as an alternative to jail and life in Philadelphia or the cities. Um, they, it was kind of a hoods in the wood program. Um, they lived in teepees. They, they, they embraced a lot of the Native American culture, uh, which seemed to work really well with this groups. And, uh, and they had, they, you know, they had the, a wagon train, which would transit up and down the East Coast, you know, at two miles an hour, south in the, summer, south in the winter and north in the summer. Um, 
it was a it was a very interesting program. And and where I came in is they had two boats. They had the Bill of Rights and they had the the Western Union, which was a cable laying ship out of Key West, and they renamed it the New Way. And basically the two boats would transit the East Coast, up and down, Newport to Florida, Maine to Florida. Uh, and they would do a high school program on board with with a, with high school teachers, so these kids could earn their high school diplomas. Um, it, it it was a neat program. Uh, they had uh, there was a sailing staff and there was a treatment staff, and 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 certainly there was some overlap. But basically, the treatment staff worked with the education and the discipline and the structure for the kids. And then when we were sailing, the kids would come work with us. And, and work and sail the boat. Some of the kids have been on the boat for a long time, six, seven, eight months, which is a long time on a schooner. Uh, but it was, it was very neat. It was a, it was a neat program. Um, it was my first schooner command and uh, it was a challenge, but certainly not overwhelming. Uh, and I did enjoy the work and it honestly felt like, you know, I got some great pictures. I wasn't able to put in the slideshow of the kids who seemed to seem to really embrace it somewhat. But uh, we would get the, we would be tied up to a dock and some little blue hair old lady would walk up and she'd say, oh, this is wonderful. This is so incredible. What a beautiful boat. Young man, what do you do have, what do you, how did you get on this boat? What do you have to do to get on this boat? And he would look over and say, you got to get arrested, lady, you know, uh, but uh, <laughs> they embraced it. Their favorite thing was to do a laundry on Sunday because they actually got to go and sit in, in the laundromat. And that was their highlight. Um, uh, they thought the sailing was a bunch of work, but it was fun. It, it was good. Uh, I think it was a great program. And uh, uh, it was also here that I met my wife, Diane, who was the cook on board. And uh, that story still continues to this day. Um, the next boat, I don't think anybody will have a hard time recognizing this, especially since I put the name right there. Uh, Pride of Baltimore II, um, I sailed as chief mate. Uh, and got on board in the spring of 97. Uh, it was it's a, it was a top line boat of the day. I mean, she still is a pretty much a, a, an amazing boat and considered a, a piece of the piece de la resistance. But uh, she uh, was getting ready to do two things. And one was to head up to Newport and Mystic Seaport Museum to do a filming of the movie Amistad. And uh, we spent uh, a couple of weeks between Newport and, uh, and Mystic Seaport, Chubb's Wharf and watching, you know, all the actors going up and down. And, and we had the crew had a great time with it. They, they painted the boat jet black. So we called her the, the, the stealth schooner because she didn't have her yellow stripe. And they antiqued her, which was a little bit distressing because um, uh, that antiquing paint did not wash off the way they said it would. Uh, but it was really amazing to watch how they made the movie and be, especially be part of it. Um, there are people that I know that are in the movie, but they're usually like hidden underneath the canvas on deck. Um, <laughs> Morgan Freeman said to Sam Fixman, you want to be in the movie? Yeah, go over there, get underneath that dark, pull it over. You'll be in the movie. Um, uh, and then after that, we continued on and we, we joined the American Sail Training Association uh, Great Lakes uh, tour that year and went to a variety of ports all up and down the Great Lakes and showed off the boat and the spirit and the engine engineering and everything else. So it was, it was pretty neat. Uh, the next image here is of two favorite boats. One is the Pride of Baltimore II and the other one is Virginia. Excuse me. <coughs> um, this picture was taken about three miles off of Virginia Beach. It was uh, 2007, we were coming up from uh, the East Coast tour. We had started in Florida, both vessels, and we're coming out of uh, Charleston and headed to Richmond. And uh, both of us had been motor sailing until we saw each other. And a uh, pride called us up and said, hey, and we, you know, good to see you, what's going on? Uh, do you have any ice cream? And we actually did have ice cream. So we loaded it into a skiff and, sent the boat over to deliver it to Pride. Uh, and then both boats, it was a light breeze day. Uh, both boats started setting sail and we set more and more sail until you could see that both boats have every stitch of canvas we have. And we started sailing around in a little ballet sort of follow the leader thing about three miles off of Virginia beach. Cause we had some time, 
We didn't have to be in Richmond yet. And uh, it was it was a phenomenal crew moment. We had photographs from aloft on both boats looking at the other boat. We had the small boats in the water. So there were all kinds of photographs like you could see here. And, uh, and it was just a really, really neat afternoon. And, and one of the things we did learn from that is that Virginia actually has a turn of speed over pride on certain points of sale. And it was the first time we'd seen that. And that was really, really exciting. Uh, and uh, so, but anyway, we, they started to get later. And so we cut loose and started sailing for home and we were headed to Richmond and we went up through the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Virginia had, uh, we were wing and wing with both topsails set as we went through the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel with pride right behind us. It was a, it was a great sail. We struck sail after that and anchored and continued on under power. So, so this is Virginia. Uh, Virginia was built in two thousand, launched in two thousand and five, a replica of a nineteen seventeen schooner, a pilot schooner, uh, built on the Norfolk waterfront, launched in two thousand and five. Uh, what I really liked her about her was that she had uh, she had a fishing schooner rig. I'm a fishing schooner fan after sailing Spirit of Massachusetts. And she was a knockabout or is a knockabout, meaning she doesn't have a bowsprit. So you don't have to worry about sending crew out there. You don't have to worry about taking down light poles when you're trying to dock the ship, uh, all of that. And uh, uh, she is fast and handy. She was a great boat. Um, and this picture here is taken uh, during the 2007 Chesapeake Bay schooner race. Uh, and she is sailing in 25 knots of breeze with all sail set. Uh, the boat was actually hard to control, but we weren't about to take in any sail. Um, so we were, we, we were on our way. Uh, this series of photographs shows a couple of things here. And one, you can see Virginia is uh, doing kind of her thing. That's her stock photograph. Um, the picture you see there with pride behind us uh, was a picture that we had for the entire race. Um, pride was there. They, they would get closer, they would go try to go to windward, they try to go to leeward, uh, but this was, was, was Virginia's day. Um, and part of it was because we had just such an amazing crew. Hank Mosley was the mate. We had put together a rock star crew and we had a great year. That whole year uh, was just phenomenal. And, and the board had asked uh, what I needed to do this big year because it was a tall ship East Coast year. And I said, we need a Hank Mosley. And they said, what's a Hank Mosley? I said, we'll hire him and, and, and he'll fill it. We'll fill it in. And that's what Hank did. He came and he put together a great crew, trained them really, really, really well. And uh, we went off and sailed the crap out of the boat. Um, we did the entire East Coast uh, with the Tall Ships events, Florida and Nova Scotia. We actually did a TV special on board the boat from, uh, from Baltimore, to Newport, and uh, and that was filmed. Uh, uh, that was aired, you know, soon thereafter. We actually sailed into Newport Harbor with everything set and rounded up and jived off of uh, Ida Lewis Yacht Club, and then went, went along the waterfront, firing our cannons as fast as we could. Or I can't. We had one cannon just shooting cannons, which is fabulous, and then rounded up in front of the yacht club and struck sail. Uh, I found out later that we weren't supposed to do that and the harbor master was mad at us. I was wondering why we were the only one who did it, but uh, oh well. <laughs> so uh, that was also the year, uh, not only did we win the great Chesapeake Bay schooner race, uh, we set a course record. And uh, we also had wins in the Gloucester Marathon Schooner Festival and every other race that we entered that year. Uh, it, was, it was just an amazing year. And you could see that beautiful picture of her uh, anchored um, just uh, getting ready to take flags there. So uh, the race itself, like I said, 25 knots, full beam, uh, full sail, beam reach speeds up to 13, 14 knots. Uh, the boat was hard to hold down. Um, if you let the boat head up a little bit, she would take off like a rocket and start luffing. So there was only about three of us who could sail the boat uh, to hold her down. And there was no thought about reducing sail. Uh, we were we were going on we were going. Um, at one point we did have to we did end up fore reaching a little bit and had to fall off and jive to Clear Smith Point. And uh, Jan told me later, Jan who was driving Pride said, "I thought you had handed us the race right there." And uh, we but we had no other choice. 
And so we jived. And when we jived back on the course and we did our final leg down, um, the, Hank asked me if they wanted to sit, reset the fishermen. And I said, of course not. Why would we, you know, but, but we have to. And, and we did. And we were able to keep that, that record going. And, uh, and, and that was the year we set the record. Uh, the best part about it is we got a case of beer from Pride of Baltimore too. And the reasoning behind it, and uh, the story was that the captain had told the mate who delivered the beer that we should consider the debt paid. The original deed of gift, I guess for lack of a better word, of the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race was the first boast at the other end got to get a case of beer from the other boat uh, so that we were able to get that that beer from Pride of Baltimore too was just very 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 wonderful gift and very thoughtful uh, from the crew of Pride and greatly appreciated so now I'm going a little bit over here so I'm going to speed up a tad but uh, the next picture is a whole nother direction that I, I tried to go in a couple of times uh, I mentioned Joe McGady at one point and Joe McGady <laughs> Uh, family was uh, actually uh, owned a construction company, a marine construction company down in Curtis Bay. And uh, he called me up one day and he was he was driving this boat, the tugboat, and he wanted to go into the office and he needed a captain. And he says, you want to drive a tugboat? So I said, OK. So I ended up driving to Ireland on and off for three years. Uh, and it led me to go spend some time on the tugboats. I actually have a master of towing license uh, because of it. Um, but the problem was I kept quitting, <laughs> quitting to go sailing. I did that once with Letty Howard when we did the eight month experience at sea period uh, program, uh, headed down all the way down. That was, that was an interesting program uh, story for another day. I went to work for Dan Towing out of the canal and uh, uh, working as a mate trainee, doing the coal run from Newport News to, to Baltimore and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, uh, and, I went to work for McAllister in Philadelphia. Um, Dan didn't work out. I, I, I just was, they, they couldn't, I was sick, getting sick and jumping from boat to boat. So uh, somebody called me from McAllister and said, we need a mate. And so it was really kind of neat. It was a neat boat, uh, Jeffrey McAllister. And we ran a chemical barge from Marcus Hook, just south of Philadelphia. And we brought it to Baltimore. And it was a small barge. We did two or three times a week. And, uh, and where we tied up in Baltimore was directly across the river from where the Ireland and the Martin G. Imbeck Marine Construction Company was. Um, so, but, uh, but I quit that job to go sailing as well. And, uh, and then when I got done with that, I came back and I went to work for McCall's, McAllister in Baltimore and uh, did the ship, ship assist work. And I was working that boat when I got called to uh, come sail Virginia. And then I sailed Virginia for three years and then switched back and started tugboat and got a job with Buchanan Marine. And that was kind of fun because we would go up to Richmond, light boat with light barges, and then pick up four barges loaded with crushed stone and rock. And we would come down the James River, which was, you know, tight enough, especially with four barges, uh, two by two wide. We would drop two in Norfolk and then head on down to Kitty Hawk through the intercoastal waterway. Um, and if anybody's ever been down the ICW, you know it's a skinny bit of water with uh, lots of mud and lots of turns. And, and you, yet we would go down there at night during the day, any weather, uh, with, with two 90-foot uh, barges in front of us. So we would have about 300-foot uh, of tug and tow and we would go down through, loaded with stone, come out the other end and then duck into Kitty Hawk and drop the stone off and then come back with, uh, with light barges. Um, it was very challenging work and I, uh, I learned a great deal uh, doing it. Uh, great boat handling skills. You know, we, we had shirts made up that, that, that bit said, uh, Buchanan 11, pushing rock through mud and sand because we were moving sand and mud pretty much the whole time we were in the ICW. The only thing that kept the intercoastal waterway open was the tugboats pushing mud uh, aside as they came through. Um, so, yeah. So, but that job ended when the contract ran out and uh, moved on to the next uh, next project. The next and last project in my story here is this amazing boat. 
uh, Brilliant. And some of you are probably familiar with Brilliant. I knew a little bit about her. I knew her as a pretty little shiny schooner, uh, small and why would, you know, it's not RV Darby enough. Uh, little did I know how much it was going to change my life. My wife noticed the ad and what struck her was the fact that um, you got weekends off. You would do a five-day program and go home. And, uh, and so we took the job. We moved up here to Mystic. Uh, and it has been a transformative experience as well. Uh, it's incredible boat. It's the longest boat I've ever been in command of. I, I drove her for seven years. Um, she has a great program, high school programs. Um, and, and again, I, I, even after I left Brilliant, I stayed with the Seaport for three more years. Uh, I, I still run her every once in a while. I did a couple of trips this, uh, this last couple of years. Um, I really love the boat and she is amazing. She has a new captain, uh, Sarah Armour, who just does an amazing, amazing job with the boat and the program. And she's taking it to the next level. Uh, she is really, really an amazing woman. So, but some of these next pictures, you can see some of her sailing qualities. So, uh, Brilliant was designed in 1932 uh, by Owen Stevens. She was built by Nevins down in New York City and commissioned by Walter Barnum as a cruising yacht. Um, Owen Stevens became famous, but this is before he was famous because he was only 22 years old when he designed this boat. And this is only his 12th design. He became legendary, of course, uh, part of one of the spark, half of Sparkman and Stevens. Uh, and the yard was the, one of the best yards in the United States. And it was built during the height of the Great Depression. So the workers were extremely glad for the work. And you can see that in some of the quality of the building the materials used. Um, the story is, is that the Barnum Bank rolled the workers' salaries for a year. Uh, so they, they took special care in building the boat. The boat has a, is, is teak planking on oak frames. The frames are about 18 inches apart. They're very small, very tight. She's a very, very strong boat. And uh, she has never been fully rebuilt. She has a new deck when the old deck got worn through by the 10, 11,000 kids that crossed it. Uh, and her transom was replaced. And they figured that was a, a, a had gotten uh, in a, an accident in her early years. Uh, her rig is still the original rig, um, and they started to, uh, they re her, they didn't have to re her until 1960, uh, 30 years, the same cocking. When they started to refasten her, they stopped because they realized the fasteners they were pulling out were better than the fasteners that they were going to put in. So they just stopped there, and, and so she still refastened with the same fasteners. Um, an incredible story. Um, she, she was never an old wooden boat sitting on a pier, so she didn't suffer that degradation. Um, you know, after the second, she sailed as a picket boat during the, the Second World War. After the war, Briggs Cunningham bought her, and he uh, wanted to do some racing with her. So he had uh, Sparkman Stevens design a new, a new sail plan, and they raised the mast. Both masts got, got heightened. Uh, I don't know exactly by how much, probably about 20, 20, 25 feet, something like that. But you can see in this photograph how tall the rig really is. Uh, there she is racing uh, at the Pat West Regatta in Martha's Vineyard. Um, he increased the rig height and, uh, and took her racing. Um, Briggs also is known, uh, I don't know if you know what a Cunningham is, the luff downhaul on a sail, that Kringle, that uh, is known as a Cunningham was invented by by Briggs Cunningham. But anyway, I, I sidetracked. Um, she's a great sailor. She's stable and fast. Uh, but unfortunately, schooners had really given, given way to the modern rigs, the catches and the, and the, and the sloops and, uh, uh, that were being taken, taken over the racing scene. Um, so he had her down in, at the Pequot Yacht Club in Southport. And, uh, he was taking local kids out sailing and, and, and saw what, what good it did with the, with the kids. And uh, so he donated. Uh, brilliant to Mystic Seaport Museum with a healthy endowment to keep the boat sailing. And that was in 1953. And the boat has been sailing every year with the exception of one year during COVID. Um, when the uh, Seaport got the boat, uh, they converted, they converted her Marconi main, her, her gaff rig main to a Marconi main, uh, made it a little bit safer, not having that gaff lying around. And of course, probably helped her windward ability. Uh, the story is it did not help her, her off the wind ability, but, but you know, sacrifices have to be made. 
Uh, her programs are five and 10 day live aboard programs for youth 15 to 18 years of old. Uh, no experience necessary. Uh, actually, it's preferred they don't have any, so you don't have to undo bad habits. Um, the, the Brilliant program is a lot like many of the sail training programs, and they're using the boat as a platform to teach life skills, to teach communication, responsibility, hard work. And to do that, you use seamanship and navigation and sail handling and watch standing and, and all of those things. You know, what makes a good sailor makes a good uh, citizen. And the skills that we teach on these sail training boats uh, translate very well to shore going situations. Uh, Brilliant program is one of the oldest sail training programs in the United States. And they figure that over 11,000 kids have crossed those decks. And that's, of course, why we had to replace the decks about 20 years ago. Um, Stability is the name of this boat's program. Uh, she uh, has just been doing the same thing for so long uh, that it's just perfect. Um, her captains have a tendency to spend a long time on board. When I joined the boat in 2012, I was only the fifth captain to join to sail Brilliant as a captain since 1953. And that's testimony to an amazing boat and an amazing program. And, uh, you know, she is one of the formative boats in my life experience as well. So, so. but anyway, um, I've reached the end of the slideshow and, uh, and have reached the end of my talk. I hope you don't mind that I went over a little bit. My apologies. Um, the last slide is kind of what I'm doing now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I left Mystic Seaport Museum uh, in, last December and started my own business, uh, Nicholas Alley Marine. And basically, I'm doing the same thing, but just uh, under a different uh, program. So, uh, Captain for Hire, Education Program Development, Private Instruction, and uh, I, I, the first year uh, seems to offer a lot of lot of hope. We we found some great programs to be part of, and a lot of great boats to sail. So. Uh, we'll have more on that later. Maybe we'll have that as another presentation. So, um, I want to thank you all for your patience and for tuning in tonight. And uh, I think we have a Q&A after this. And I guess that's what I got. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Nicholas. It's just great. What a life. My God. I want to remind the rest of you, um, we do have a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click that and type in uh, anything you have. One of the first ones that pops up right here right now, Nicholas, is uh, you still seasick? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Kathy Hill wants to know if uh, Lane Briggs was an influence for you. Uh, very much so, uh, directly and indirectly. Yeah, tell us about that. So um, <laughs> the first time I ever saw my wife, to be yeah. was on the stern of the Norfolk Rebel. No way. So Diane sailed with Lane. Um, she cooked for Lane. Uh, she started doing a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So so one of the most amazing things about living in Norfolk, uh, running Virginia, was the relationship that, you know, because Diane had already had the relationship. She lived at the marina. She had a houseboat. She cooked for Lane. She knew all the crew. Um, uh, and uh, and it was just a really amazing to get to know that entire family. Uh, Lane came sailing on Virginia with us, and I sailed on the Norfolk Rebel a bunch uh, as crew. So it was it was very special there. Lane, <laughs> when I was interviewing for the job and I came for that first board meeting, I had my suit and my tie on, and afterwards we went by Norfolk Marine Rebel Marine. And Lane tried to cut my tie in half. <laughs> nice, nice. You gotta love. That's it. what happened if you showed up with a tie to the Rebel Marine outfit. So anyway, sorry. I like it. Uh, hey, uh, Mike McManus writes, "What's the one thing you teach the rest of us sailors that we can share with our students and friends?" Um, listen to the boat. One of the things that I've seen is so many people uh, have become so technical. They're looking at the screens and they're looking at the instruments and they're looking at that. And, uh, and sometimes you just have to see how the boat is, how does the boat feel? Uh, I've turned to crew and I've started saying, the boat will tell you what it wants, but you have to be willing to listen and get your head out of the instruments and, and look at what's going on around you. And more importantly, feel what the boat feels like. 
you know, I think that's pretty good advice. It's certainly the experience I've had with my crews. And <laughs> is it is it going over on its ear? <laughs> you don't need an inclinometer to tell you the deck's getting wet. <laughs> just, just saying, just saying. Hey, um, if you could sail anywhere on any boat, which combination would you put together? Wow. You're oh, welcome. <laughs> I, that's sort of like that question of what's your favorite Caribbean island? There, I, there is no such thing. There's no such thing. <laughs> There's no such thing, you know. I could see sailing a, a small uh, a small skiff all the way around uh, uh, Narragansett Bay. I oh, think that would be fabulous. I think the waters that were here, the Chesapeake Bay, what a beautiful body of water. Yeah. Uh, the main coast, uh, main coast is something that doesn't have a propeller or rudder that will get caught in lobster pots. Um, there is I, I, yeah, there is. I, I do like schooners. I, I'm beginning to like small schooners. You know, they're nice. I, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I like it. And last, I'd like to ask you uh, from my side, did you ever see yourself as making a living on the water or what, did you just sort of fall into these opportunities as you went? I, I just followed the opportunity as they went. Um, basically, I would ask myself when I looked at the boat, boat uh, and, the, and the money they were willing to pay um, and basically say, can I live on that? Is it a living wage? Can I afford to take this job? Yeah. And 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 then the, the, Bob Keith, when I was trying to get more money out of him running Mini V, said to me, he said, I said, Bob, you know, I really like to make more than twelve year, twelve dollars an hour here. Uh, and he said, Nicholas, you have two choices. You know, you have to if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to learn how to live frugally. And uh, and and that is certainly how Diane and I live our lives. Yeah. And um, and uh, and it, it just worked out. I, 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 I'm in awe that I've been able to make a living and, and to live a real life. I mean, we you know, we've had three houses. We've had stuff. We have cars. We're yeah. not in debt. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes. So, yes, I was able to make a living at it. Very cool. Uh, Gerard has asked, do you normally carry a light and a heavier fisherman? No. No, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I was not ever cognizant of having more than one fisherman. Neither, neither so I sailed on Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant has two fishermen, but they're identical, so you can tack them real quick. Nice. That nice. pisses people off. <laughs> I totally love that. Well, looks like uh, anybody else. Uh, we got any more questions coming in? Great. We have still got 36 of you who have hung in there, and I want to thank you all very much for joining us tonight. I would encourage you to visit the American uh, Schooner Association website, mschooner.net, or the Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race website, gcbsr.org, and uh, learn out a little bit more about our programs. We would love to have you come along and help us out whenever you could. This series is about the movers and shakers in our world, in our industry. And if you all have any suggestions of who might make a great speaker, because certainly I can't know everyone, please don't be shy about shooting me an email. At the same time, you feel free to shoot Captain Nicholas an email. He's done an awesome job tonight. And Nicholas, I want to thank you so very much for your time and all of you for joining us tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, du Duncan. I really appreciate all your help. That worked out really well. All right, guys. We're going to hang up. Nick, I'll pick you up offline. All right. Very good. Bye, -bye everybody.